So who would have guessed on a day, such miserable weather, it's such a great class, right? You come in with all these treats, chocolate. What more could you ask? Um, okay, so this is going to be lots and lots and lots of fun. Um, let's see. One announcement is that um, the class is on Thursday and all the sections will go on this week as always. So um, come for Thursday, oh. <laughs> come for Thursday, and um, and um, don't forget your sections. Uh, all of them are important. Um, so um, don't eat your chocolates yet because we're going to learn about them, um, and we're going to we're going to actually going to have a fun time um, based on uh, what we saw last night. We thought it'd be really super fun to bring Daniel along uh, and use his magic with the microscope to see if we can understand something about what's going on. Um, and um, we'll talk about more. We'll talk more about that um, on Thursday and again next week. But it's really a, a tremendous uh, lesson to, to to see, and it should be really cool. We we did a little bit last night. It'll be a lot of fun, and so Daniel will. We'll um, take some samples and put them on the microscope, and then if we can see something, we'll interrupt um, Alexandra and, and just look at them. I think it's also going to be something that Alexandra will like, too. It'll be fun. Um, okay, so um, it's more about texture and mouthfeel. Uh, we did this uh, a couple of weeks ago where we talked about the elasticity, right? That's a solid. But not all foods are solid. Some are liquid, and for liquid, it's viscosity, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and we'll talk about um, all the more molecular origins uh, and the physical origins of viscosity um, on Thursday. And um, we'll talk about, or in the lab, you'll do mayonnaise. I'm going to show you how something that we talk about today is just like mayonnaise but much yummier if you have a sweet tooth like me. Um, okay, so remember, we talked about uh, elasticity, and we said um, that increasing elasticity is increasing stiffness, right? Uh, this raw candy is really, really stiff. It's a high elasticity. Meat, we measured it. We cooked, uh, Daniel cooked us some steak. Um, the more you cook it, the more elastic it gets. So uh, the elasticity tells you how done it is. Um, and um, here, um, a gel is much, much weaker. Actually, just as a sort of an interesting story, I, 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 I was uh, at a, a sort of birthday party uh, for a, a really good friend of mine who used to work with me, with me and my group, and there were a lot of people who, we work, who worked to, together. And there was one of, uh, some, some former person in my group who now works for Procter & Gamble, and he does all these measurements, and he told me, again, which I tried to, to, to say to you, that, you know, they spend all their time in Procter & Gamble trying to understand mouthfeel, skin feel, things like that, and quantifying it by doing the kind of measurements that we do and much more sophisticated forms of the same measurements that we talk about in this class. And he says, we still are, they still don't really understand exactly how to relate the different measurements that you make with what it feels like, how, how you perceive food or, or other products. It's still an area of research. And so this is a great thing to think about for, for your final projects. How can you take something and you know what it looks like, you know what it tastes like, you know what it feels like in your mouth or when you touch it. How can you quantify it? It's still a, an area of real research. Um, and so, you know, we try to give the, the basic ideas, but it's still something people do. Uh, they do all the time. Uh, so today and Thursday, we're going to talk about the liquid. That's a viscosity. Um, here are different kinds of liquids. Uh, gravy is uh, really thick, creamy, creamy uh, Italian uh, salad dressing. Um, a really, uh, really good milkshake. It's so viscous, it's so thick that the, uh, the, the uh, straw stands up in it. And so 
the, uh, viscos the viscosity tells you how easy something flows. And um, here's some examples. Uh, when you have gravy, you like to thicken it so it flows more slowly. Um, the milkshake, we say, is thick. Uh, the um, um, creamy Italian dressing, honey. Honey flows, but it takes a long time. And here is something that will flow, but it's really, really stiff. It's a really good New England clam chowder, right? If you did um, Manhattan clam chowder, it wouldn't be so thick, right? It'd flow more easily. It's New England clam chowder made with all these potatoes and yummy stuff. Uh, we'll do a demonstration of mac and cheese, the flow of that in, in the next class. And so the thickness or the flow, the resistance of flow is what viscosity is, so water flows really easily. Anybody know something that flows even more easily than water? We've actually used some of that. Anybody think of anything? Liquid nitrogen, yeah. Is that what you're going to say? Ethanol. See? Ethanol. ethanol, yeah, that probably does. But liquid nitrogen really flows easily, right? It flows like mad. So that's low viscosity. Honey, much thicker. And what the hell is bread dough doing here? Is that a liquid? You shake your head. You're shaking your head. You'd say, no, it's not, right? But put bread dough on the table and come back at the end of class. And it will flow. It'll move a bit. So associated with viscosity is not just the resistance of flow, but there's a time scale, how long it takes. So something that's super viscous takes a long time to flow. You've got to know, you've got to rem remember that physical property. Uh, so how do you increase viscosity? We'll talk about this on Thursday. You can make a reduction. You can... Um, just take away the liquid and increase the, uh, the, the remnants of the gravy, reduce it. You can add starch, add something to make things flow. You can make an emulsion. This picture used to be mayonnaise, which is what we'll do in the lab. But we realized that the ganache that Alexandra is going to make is an emulsion. We're going to look at that. And this is a this is a much yummier. I mean, okay, I like mayonnaise, but boy, this tastes really super good. You'll you'll get a taste of it today, um, and we can add polymers, and we'll describe all of this on uh, Thursday. So really, it's a pleasure to introduce a Alexander Wishnant. Uh, she's a chocolatier. She'll tell you a little bit about herself, and she's the owner of Gaté Comme des Filles, a chocolate place in Somerville. So, Alexandra. It's all yours. Hello. Um, it's good to be here. I'm really excited about today, especially about the microscope part. Um, last night we got a little preview of some of the ganache under the microscope, and it was really beautiful. So I'm excited for that. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about my background, and then we'll taste one of our bonbons from my shop. And then we're gonna go through two demonstrations. The first one is making ganache and all the different stages of ganache. And then the second one is tempering dark chocolate by hand without a thermometer. So I actually um, grew up in Cambridge and um, went to Duke in Durham for um, physics. While I was there, I ended up um, really getting into my French class because I had this wonderful teacher. So I decided to go to Paris to finish learning French because I had always been like forced into it for so many years. Um, I thought I should like have it, all the hard work pay off by becoming fluent in French. So I signed up for Le Cordon Bleu Pastry School in Paris. And that was just kind of a way to like learn French in a real setting in France with real French people. But I ended up loving the pastry too and the chocolate and so I went back to finish Duke um, physics and then went back to Paris to do more pastry, more chocolate. Um, I interned at La Durée when there were only four stores in Paris, so I really got to see like the inner workings of a pastry shop. 
And I especially loved the chocolate department, which was in this old uh, apartment building, like in an old apartment that they had turned into a chocolate factory. It was very, very small, like the size of this area. And then I just became obsessed with chocolate. Later, I worked at Chez Panisse in Berkeley, and I ended up leading all these chocolate tastings for the staff and making chocolates for the restaurant and like bringing in chocolate suppliers. So my chefs told me, because um, I was in the pastry department, there were like eight of us in that department. And they said, you're really obsessed with chocolate. Why don't you just like turn this into a business? Because I would bring in stuff like this. And um, what I learned at Chez Panisse was that the freshness was really important to the chocolate. Because um, we were in a restaurant setting, we could make something and serve it that night. And it wasn't like a normal chocolate boutique, you know, where you make something and then it sits there for a month or two months. Two months. <laughs> um, so getting to make the really fresh ganaches at Chez Panisse was like, oh, what, is there a way to make a business where people are eating the chocolates in the first few days instead of months later? Um, because if you use real ingredients, like if you use real raspberry puree instead of like raspberry flavoring, the flavor will fade after like five days. And if you use strawberry puree, the flavor fades after two days. So, and the texture changes too. So I found that we'll go through making ganache, but I make this Meyer lemon ganache and after like, like the first two to three days, it's just so luscious and dreamy. And then it just um, hardens a little bit and it's still good, but it's like not the same as it was in day two. So I built my concept for starting my own business around fresh chocolates, bringing people, making them in small batches every week, different flavors every week, telling people to eat them right away. Um, I ended up going to business school at Cornell for two years. Um, my dad talked me into that one. And then I was like, I'm going to start a chocolate factory. And then I ended up doing management consulting at Bain in Paris after that for a little bit. Um, and then I got back on track and I started Gatte Comme Fee in Paris in 2012. Um, just making chocolates in my apartment, selling them at different pop-ups that I would make around the city. And one time I got to be like a rotating chocolatier in this wonderful chocolate shop in the fifth. So I was making the chocolates in the back and this woman, Maria Len, gave me a quarter of her shop to like make into my own little shop. So that was a cool experience. The French had never seen anything like my chocolates because they were very handmade and they had all these, like when you're tempering chocolate, if you work with it when it's a little bit thicker, you can leave trails where your hand was. And that was very Chez Panisse and not at all very French because the French chocolates are all very industrial made, industrially made. Um, so I went, when my visa expired, I went back to San Francisco, set up shop there, started selling in eight different stores around the Bay Area. Um, Byright said my chocolates were the best they'd ever tasted, which was like really great, great news. Um, <clears throat> and I was in a commercial kitchen there, which was hard because it's like you pay by the hour, you have to share this kitchen space with everyone and it's not a chocolate kitchen at all. Um, but then when I moved back to my hometown, I found um, Somerville Chocolate in Aeronaut Brewery, and he's a chocolate maker, Bean to Bar, and he let me just move in and become like his roommate, like squatter for three years. So he was making chocolate bars and I was making chocolates next to him and selling them to the brewery. And then I finally got my own lease at Bow Market in Somerville um, in 2018. So we've been there almost three years making these bonbons um, every week, shipping them overnight only around the country so that they're always really fresh. And then we also make chocolate mousse in a cone, which is on the postcard. It's not ice cream, it's chocolate mousse. It's so good. <laughs> um, we also make brownies, hot chocolate, everything like just really dark and luscious and rich. So a specific kind of person who likes the really dark, rich chocolate. Um, oh, and then I also have a wine bar that I opened this summer called Zuzu's Petals in Inman Square. We make chocolate mousse there too and chocolate cake and serve it with really good wine. And it's cell phone free, so everyone's not on their phones. They're just talking to each other, enjoying <clears throat> each other's company and the wine and the chocolate. So it's really cool. People actually like that about it. <laughs> Um, so we can taste a bonbon now, if you want to try it, so you get an idea of what we make. So this shows both of the techniques we're going to show. The outside is tempered chocolate and the inside is a ganache. 
And ganache is one of the two classical French fillings for chocolates. The other one is praliné, which is like roasted nuts, usually almonds and hazelnuts combined or separate with a dark caramel ground up into a paste. And then ganache is an emulsion of um, chocolate and water, which we're going to show in a minute. Can anyone taste what kind, it, like what flavor it is? Any ideas? Last night, everyone knew what flavor it was. I wonder how. Yes? What? Lavender? No, close. It has flowers in it. Earl Grey, yeah. It's Earl Grey tea. So tea is an example of a flavor that fades pretty quickly if you use if you just infuse it into the cream. Um, so that's why we're making them all the time. And this one, the ganache, you might notice has kind of like a fluffier texture than most ganaches, and it but it also melts in your mouth, and it's really rich, like I said. Um, so this is partially due to the fact that we're not going to make the ganache in a sous vide, which a lot of chocolatiers do, and they do that to suck the air out of the ganache as it's made, and then that prolongs the shelf life. That's another thing to prolong the shelf life. So the fluffy, um, we leave the air bubbles in the ganache, which adds to the fluffiness. So ganache is something that chocolatiers do, like it's our main skill, I guess. And then tempering is something that chocolatiers and chocolate makers need to know how to do. Does anyone know the difference between a chocolatier and a chocolate maker? Or can guess? No? Um, Examples of chocolatiers would be like me, um, E.H. Chocolatier, uh, Beth's Chocolate in Newton. Chocolate maker would be like Taza, um, Lint, Hershey's. Who else is a chocolate maker? Valrona. <laughs> no? <laughs> All right, well, chocolate makers basically start with the raw, their raw materials are cacao beans. Um, which grow in the tropics. They grow right on the trunks of trees, and they're harvested year-round. Um, I'll just quickly explain how chocolate is made, in case you don't know. They cut these beautiful pods off the tree, which turn all different colors, and when they're ripe, they could be any color. They could be like green, brown, red, yellow, purple. It's really cool. They cut them open, and then the, the inside is full of cacao beans with pulp, and they let that ferment, um, traditionally under like a layer of banana leaves. And then once it's fermented, that, the fermentation helps all the nice, um, you know, tasty elements enter the bean and creates the complexity of flavor. And they dry them in the sun, and then they ship them to other, normally other parts of the world where it's not as hot because they only grow where it's really hot, but you can't, it's harder to make chocolate where it's really hot. So traditionally they're shipped to the northern and southern hemisphere, well, really to Europe in the beginning, where they take the beans... Um, roast the beans, winnow them, which means um, they're taking the shells off and just getting the nibs, which are on the inside. And when we grind up the nibs, it turns into a kind of paste because um, much like peanut butter, like when you grind peanuts, it starts as like a dry peanut and then through all the grinding and the friction, all the fat comes out and turns into like a liquid. Same thing with the cacao bean. It's actually 55% fat on the inside. So once you grind it, it releases the fat and it turns into a liquid and then they um, can temper that liquid temper, which we'll show you, put it into like a mold of a bar, and then you have a chocolate bar. So that's what the chocolate maker does. The chocolatier starts with chocolate, like it often comes in pieces like this. This is called a fev um, from Valrona in France, but lots of different companies make chocolate for the chocolatier or for the pastry chef. And then we remelt it. It comes tempered. You'll know what that means soon. Um, we melt it. Once you melt it, it's untempered, and then you have to retemper it if you want to put it into a different shape or use it for anything like a, f a shell or like a finished product. If you're just using it for filling, you don't have to temper it, so you can just melt it down. Um, and then chocolatiers make all kinds of things like ganaches, pralines, um, mondiants. You can dip all kinds of stuff. Well, you know what chocolatiers make. <laughs> 
all those yummy things that aren't pure chocolate bars. So why don't we taste the little ganache squares now? Uh, we have A and B. The difference between them, they're the same ingredients. One just has more chocolate in it. And I just wanted to have you notice the difference in texture more than the difference in taste because I'll just tell you, A has more chocolate, so A is going to have a more intense chocolate taste. Does anyone have any comments on the textures, the textural differences? Like, I'm going to taste them too. B should be smoother on your tongue. A, um, depending on the size of your taste buds, like it could feel a little bit scaly or gummy. Um, so basically A is um, a ganache that wasn't fully emulsified and B is a fully emulsified ganache. So B is like what we would use in our own chocolates. A is something that would be like, you have to melt it down and fix it. <laughs> which you can do, which is cool. Actually, chocolate's really cool that way because even if you mess up like a, ch a solid chocolate thing, you can melt it down. It's harder to do that with a lot of other art forms. So to make a ganache, we're going to start with melted chocolate. This is 70% Valverona chocolate. It's from this bag here. It's a blend of different chocolate from around the world, different cacao. And you always want your bowl to be in your water. So we have a hot water bath called a Ben Marie. And the bowl is submerged in the water just enough so it's not overflowing, but enough to cover the whole bottom of the bowl. If you have your chocolate up here and your water down there, then you have to have boiling water to melt it and then you have steam going everywhere. And chocolate and water don't mix together. So you always keep your chocolate totally dry. Um, you'll see why. But you don't want like Last night we carried these out in the mist um, after the class, so we had to start over with new chocolate because the chocolate just like absorbs mist and water and it doesn't, doesn't do well with that. And I opened a brand new bag so it wasn't even sitting out overnight. You want to take the melted chocolate. We're going to do a little projection of just melted chocolate. Can I start adding? We might not see anything, <laughs> but it'll be cool to see what chocolate looks like. Should I start adding for the first step? Okay, so the first thing we're gonna do, we're gonna add all this cream eventually. I'm just gonna add it in stages so we can see different stages of the emulsion. Um, we're, we're going from, the chocolate is a um, mostly fat, like I said. It's like 55% fat, it has 30% sugar in this one because it's 70% chocolate. And then this cream is mostly water with like 10% milk fat. So, Wow. So we're going to switch from um, chocolate being a water in fat emulsion and then cream is a fat in water emulsion. Daniel, can you describe it or do you want me to? Okay, this is a low, this is, uh, right, I'm, zoom, I'm zooming in. I'm doing that. Oh, so this is just oh. looking at these things on the, on the microscope and we're going to continue to do that while Alexander makes them. Daniel, tell us what it wow. is. It's more brown than it was. <laughs> Let's have a look. Oh. I mean, so you can see it's a lot of particulates. Cocoa, and there's some... That looks very different. Yeah, it should. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so I think, I think the brown parts are the cocoa solid, you know, the cocoa solids. And then... And there's clear parts, which is probably the uh, water that's emulsified a bit. Well, no, there's no water. It is. There's, so a, there is. Yeah, there's a little water a in the chocolate, just because it has some moisture. It's like I'm a guess, fruit. Yeah, I'm guessing the yellow is the um, cocoa butter. Uh-huh. Cool. 
So when you add just a little bit of chocolate of water to chocolate, it um, doesn't like it at all. So we'll see. So this is 50 grams of cream, and this is 100, 1,000 grams of chocolate. So if we just add, did you want to see exactly when it starts seizing? It's starting to get very thick and hard to stir. <laughs> it's starting to look dry on the surface. It's getting really thick, kind of like frosting. Now it's really hard to start. Okay, so get another this, sample now, also. Yeah, this is very good. It's turning into kind of like a clay, and this is called seized chocolate. So if you accidentally pour water in your chocolate, this is what happens. It's called seized. Should we have a look at it? Uh, <laughs> hmm? I guess so. Should we look yeah, at it? Yeah, let's look at it. Either one is fine, but Daniel. That's the first one I took while it was still a little, um, still a little liquid. This is the This is the highest mag. Well, I, mean, I guess one thing, one thing that you can see is that it's very, um, it seems like homogenous. Right? But there's a lot more of the white spots, right? Mm -hmm. Smaller and more right. of them. Tiny, tiny little white spots. Right. Uh, and I think that's the water that's been emulsified and it's packed in. So I'm going to keep adding cream. And so, Alexander, if I could just, you think this, you're, you, what you think this is, is you've taken something that's a water in oil, mm -hmm. water in chocolate emulsion, mm -hmm. and you've added more water, mm -hmm. which is the cream. Yeah. And so we packed more water in as the emulsion, and it gets stiffer and stiffer. Yeah, I think it's sort of absorbing the water, but I don't know if it's still, do you think it's still emulsified? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. That's the only way it can st get stiff. And we'll talk about that later in class. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But then at some point it's going to break. This is, by the way, this is like mayonnaise. It's stiff like mayonnaise. It's gotten stiff in the same way that mayonnaise is stiff. Yeah. Um, if you add too much water, though, the fat can't hold it, so it's going to break and separate and that's what's going to happen next. So if I keep adding my my cream which is mostly water. We were going to do this with water but it's so much easier to see the cream because um, it's opaque. So she's and trying to add more bubbles of water, more, more drops of water. But it's so much, so much water already there that it's just not going to be possible. So watch what happens.
Tell us what you think it's like, Alexandra. What do I think it's like? Yeah. Well, it's still heating up the cream, so right now it's kind of holding together. But as the cream warms up, it's going to separate more. Um, it's sort of like getting a little oily, like when I move my whisk through it, there's not a lot of resistance anymore. And it looks really mottled on the surface. It's not shiny, like the light is being broken, out, like scattered in all directions. Um, there's no smooth surface anymore. And let's see. Yeah, as you keep stirring, it just gets more and more grainy. <laughs> Maybe another sample. another sample. Because once it gets really separated, it's going to be like just pools of oil. And that's might be too big for the sample. Just let it heat up for a second. But if you turn the bowl, you just get big like craters on the surface. It looks like diarrhea, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. So you see, you've cut the water, you've cut the cream into the, into the chocolate. It's going in as big streaks. It's like taking the, the chocolate and cutting it and filling it with cream. You can't get any more in as small drops. You don't have enough oil to surround it. So instead, it just breaks the cream. It breaks that solid stuff, and it goes in as, just as liquid water. See that? I'm going to add a little more. I don't want to overshoot the uh, most disgusting part when it's really separated. Oh, here we go. Do you want to take this one? I mean, it's, it's very, it's in two different things now, like. If anyone wants to come look at it, I don't know if you're allowed to, but they it's are. fine with me. Pretty cool. So the oil is oozing out now. Um, at least I think it's the oil. It could be the water. It's hard to tell. Well, they're One basically two phases that are not really mixed. Yeah. They're macroscopically mixed. Right. Yep. You can see there's like a river of liquid there. The solids are kind of clinging together. Is it white as the white as the liquid, and it's just forming these really large regions. You're just macroscopically mixing them. And notice, they're not spherical, right? That means that the solid is holding it together, is squeezing it. It's if it were just a drop, it would be spherical. It's not because it's being pushed by the solid. So, That's why she says it's mottly looking. Can you see how it's sliding on the edge of the bowl, too? I'll do it again. See how it's slip, all slippery on the outside? But look, uh, on the bottom, there's water that's coming out, or liquid, right? Yeah, there's liquid all around it. You see on the bottom, the liquid just draining out? Because you're still mixing the liquid in. So it's macroscopically mixing it in. Everybody see that? You see? <laughs> okay. So if we keep, so this part in my mind is like all the oil and the fat and the water separated. And then if we add, if we keep adding water, um, the water, there's like a flip flop that takes place and then it turns into a fat in water emulsion, which is what ganache is. So let's keep. So what do you call this, Alexandra? Oh, this is a split ganache. What, 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 you, what, how, did you, how did you describe it? You see, you break it, right? Oh, the breaking? Yeah. Um, so how you it describe it, you break the emulsion. Yeah, yeah, you break the, the ganache. <laughs> it's broken, so, it's separated, it's split. Those when, are the three when words. When you break an emulsion, that means if you have primarily one phase and a second phase, you break it, you flip the phases. 
So she had lots and lots of water drops inside the oil. She added a little more, and it got really thick. And when she says she breaks it, she makes the oil coalesce into drops, and the water become the continuous phase. Yeah, it's cool when you're doing it on purpose. Um, I actually broke the very first ganache I made in pastry school, and my friend who was next to me in the class was like, well, your ganache obviously broke. And I was like, shh, no, it's didn't. Everything's fine. Um, <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's hard. When you don't know how to fix it, this is a good way to do it because you can see, like, if it's really oily and liquidy, you think, like, oh, I should add more chocolate to thicken it up, but actually should add more liquid to make it less liquidy. It's kind of counterintuitive. So in the middle I have a... Do you want to try it? maybe this, the beginning of the emulsion? Just in the middle. This is called the kernel method when you're whisking just the middle of your bowl so that your ratio is different than if you were mi mixing around the outside. There's a blob of milk fat there. So it's a good way to um, stir something. Like if you break, you can do that with mayonnaise too and, all, and like vinaigrette. If you just stir a tiny corner of it so you don't get all of the oil into it at a time. So now it's starting to emulsify in the middle, but it's still sliding around the outside. So I'll just make bigger circles. But then once I get bigger circles, it's changing the ratio in the middle, so I might have to add more. But this ratio, we're at um, like 45% cream by weight of the whole mixture. And it's starting to come together now as a fat and water emulsion. So you could see there that there were large regions of, of, of water, of the white, but there were also starting to be small drops of the white in the oil. Or there were still small drops. That's going to come out. Whoa. So now it is shiny and it's starting to resist the spatula again. Um, when it was all greasy, it wasn't really resisting the spatula. I mean, the, the whisk, whatever this is. And it's starting to stick to the sides of the bowl, which means it has enough... Well, I don't know what it means, actually, but it has enough to go around for the whole bowl to stick to everything. And then I'll just add more cream to make a nicer emulsion. If you don't add enough cream, it can kind of, like, break later and be scaly. And this is about how much we add to make sample B that we tried. You also have to keep heating it. If you do this with cold, like if you stop heating it up, it won't really emulsify. You have to keep uh, heating it up for the emulsion to happen. You wanna... so, you're not, so you're not worried about losing the temper at this point? That's not an issue. Um, you can't overheat it. I'm not worried. Okay. <laughs> no. Temper is a thing of the past at this point. <laughs> but... Um, you can't, no, I don't think you can over, I mean, you could burn it, but as long as you're on the water bath, you can't really overheat it. Um, and then once you... The, the, the drops of the, of the chocolate should be so small that you're not going to really notice the, uh, Thank you. the crystals. Yeah. And um, another important thing is, like, so when your ganache is done, it's, you want to make sure it's warm, actually, it's not cold. You pour it out onto like a tray lined with plastic, and then you always make sure to wipe the water off the bottom. So first I scrape it like this on the pot, then I wipe the bottom. Otherwise, you're going to get droplets pouring into your ganache, which will kind of break the ganache. Um, you want to not touch it until it's totally set. Like, leave it, cover it with plastic, leave it at room temperature till it's at room temperature, put it in the fridge for like 12 hours, and then you can touch it again. But if you just try to move it around, like even if, like last night we were whisking it once it was cold, that's going to break the ganache. If you try to bend it um, before it's totally set, it'll, it could break the emulsion too. Very fragile. Um, so you can do this with things other than cream. You can do water, t like tea, coffee, juice, alcohol, anything with... Um, that's mostly liquid, and 
the proportion will change. So if you use water, you're going to use less water than you would have used cream because there's more water in it. Um, and you need more chocolate to keep the texture together. If you use milk chocolate, you need more chocolate than dark chocolate. And same with white chocolate because it's the, those two are softer than dark chocolate, so you have to add more to get the same consistency. Okay, now... Is that the emulsified yeah. one? It's not quite emulsified, but it's getting there, right? Where's the laser pointer? Let's look at some of these things. <laughs> Yeah, and before you could see some drops of oil. Yesterday we were talking about the size of these bubbles, and um, one. You're thing also is, foaming it, right? So there's oh, drops yes. of air. Right, because I'm not. We're not sucking the air out, so there are big air bubbles in there. These are probably air. These small drops here are the drops of oil. You see, now it's become the what used to be the continuous phase has now become drops. You can see spherical shapes here, here, here. These are now drops of oil, and the continuous phases become water. But um, what's unique, what Alexandra does, is she leaves a lot of air in, and you can see these bubbles of air. So that's a foam as well. And I think if she whisks it more, you'll get more air into it. Mm -hmm. And this, I, I've read that that increases the surface area for the, your tongue to interface with the product. I don't know if that's real, but that would increase like the, the taste um, perception. And also you just emulsifying it, like once we got past that gross separated phase, the, the little molecules are more spread out so they're not like clustering in these big clusters which you feel on your tongue as scaliness or toughness like but she also says that she has flavors and remember part of flavor is what you smell right it's the it's it's volatile she has flavors that stay in the ganache but only for a couple of days and she can keep extra flavor in because she's got these drops of air these bu these bubbles of air that improves the flavor, the sensation of flavor. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder why I wonder why the lemon changes texture after two days though. That's it's so strange. Oh another thing about ganache I wanted to tell you is when you're dipping it, so you chill it, you can cut it into squares and shape it while it's cold. And then once we dip it in cho in um, tempered chocolate, the ganache immediately becomes like a goo and then the next day it's like a perfect texture. So it goes from like perfect texture to goo and then back to perfect texture. And I don't know why. So maybe we can think about that. It's very Sounds strange. like a great tasting project, final project. <laughs> Figure that out. Something we should be able to do. We can look at it in the microscope and see what happens. Yeah. I want to taste it if you do it. <laughs> All right, so that is ganache. Any questions about ganache? Okay. We'll start tempering now. I'm just gonna move my bowl of chocolate over here. I checked to see if there's still enough chocolate, I mean enough water. There never is because of um, some of it steams off. All right, so in this bowl we have melted Manjari, which is a 64% from Madagascar, also by Valrona. And if you wanna compare samples C and D, D is the tempered chocolate, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> but can you tell me um, a few qualitative differences between them? Yes. Shinier. Snappy, yep. <laughs> Anything else? What other difference are there? Yep. It's heavier. If 
Which, which one's heavier? The pepper. Heavier, interesting. Probably denser. Yeah. yeah. I don't have that on my list. That's cool. Anything else, guys? Yeah. It what? It doesn't melt as easily. Yeah. Yeah, C is going to be more melty in your hands, right? That's how I got chocolate all over myself yesterday during the demonstration. <laughs> it's holding C for a while. Um, let's see what else. They look like. Do they look like different colors? Yeah. Like D is darker brown. I don't know why that is either. So, like I said, this is the tempering is both for chocolate makers and chocolatiers, um, and there are a number of reasons why we temper. Um, usually, so this is what you're going to be familiar with. D, whenever you buy a chocolate product, it's going to look like this. The only time you would see C is if you leave your chocolate out in the sun and then it melts and then it re solidifies. This is what would happen. Um, <clears throat> so D, uh, you take your chocolate through this temperature curve that I'm going to show you, and you end up with chocolate that is shiny, probably the most important thing. Shiny and snappy, those are like the two obvious um, like qualities that you look for in like a candy bar or chocolate bar. Um, and then it's also increasing the melting point is, is a, an effect of tempering, so you can hold it in your hand and it's, it melts in your mouth, not your hand. Actually melts at human body temperature, so I think that's part of why we love chocolate so much. Like butter has a higher melting point than chocolate, actually, so if you put like a blob of butter in your mouth, it doesn't just melt, but chocolate does. Um, and then the fact that it's denser, it's, um, it, it can prolong the shelf life of your product, so it has more of like a, a compact structure around your ganache so that air and other things can't get into the ganache, so it protects it. Um, when it's set, it contracts, so if you're making a mold, you put chocolate in the mold. If it's in temper, it'll contract, and then a few hours later, you turn it upside down, and the chocolates fall out. But if your chocolate's not in temper, they'll just stick in the mold. And they also stick to paper. So when I made these discs, disc C just stuck to the paper when I moved it at the end, and disc D, all the discs just fell off, which was pretty cool from the contraction. Um, and then the color, I don't, I'm interested in why it's a darker brown, but I don't really know. Maybe we can figure that out. Um, so we're going to attempt to temper now. It's very hard. Has anyone tried tempering before? No? It's, you have? Cool. You have to. <laughs> Did it work? <laughs> okay. It worked for you, kind of, yeah. I've learned over the years that you need like perfect conditions for tempering, so it has to be between 65 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit in the room, um, below 50% humidity, and then if it's like raining or thunderstorming outside, it's really hard. So today is a really bad day for tempering. Um, my chocolatiers are over at the shop right now making like a billion chocolates for Halloween. I feel really bad for them because it's right, it's like so rainy and they have the dehumidifier on full blast, the door closed. So with any luck, it's going to work out. Um, but yeah, sometimes like this whole summer, we just didn't make chocolates because it was too hot outside. And we thought our shop is so small that people would come in, buy chocolates, carry them out, and they would melt. So it was like, what was the point? And we don't want to waste a lot of packaging making like cold packaging because that's not what we're about. So we just wait until the fall. Now it's tempering season again. Um, the first step is melting your chocolate completely. So this is just the 64% chocolate melted again. And then we're going to cool down the chocolate and add some already tempered chocolate, which is like a shortcut way of doing it. Um, it's called the seed method. So I need to make a little spot for this. You always want to have um, cloths underneath your bowl when you take it off the bain marie so you don't get water everywhere like this all right so that was heating now we're going to go into cooling 
So this chocolate I'm adding is kind of like ice cube in that it's cooling down the liquid, um, but it's also, more importantly, shedding some of its own tempered structure into the liquid, and the melted chocolate is, is um, forming chains of crystals, of fat crystals, on top of the chains that already exist. So that's why it's called seeding. You're kind of planting seeds. Because once you have melted chocolate, all of the nice snappy crystal formations in the tempered chocolate, they just go away. So they're all just a bunch of fat crystals blobbing around different directions, no, no structure. Um, but we had to melt it because we needed it. Like if you want to make a molded chocolate or dip something in it, you have to get it into a liquid state again. But then you can't just dip into the hot chocolate because it'll look really gross. Um, and I recommend tempering. Like a lot, of, a lot of recipes, especially on the internet, they're just like melt your chocolate and dip stuff in it and then put it in the fridge, which is kind of slows down the the process of making it look gross, but then you have like wet, cho like wet untempered chocolate in the fridge because in the fridge it just attracts moisture. So you never want to put chocolate in the fridge. Um, only ganache. If you put like a like a one of these in the fridge, it'll just get tiny water condensed all over it, and then when it, you take it out again, it feels like sandpaper on your tongue. Something has happened where it's like form these little crystals on the surface. So my first seed melts it out. I'm going to keep adding seed. I think I need a helper to stir so I can draw my drawing again. Do you want to, Alex, do you want to help? Thank you. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is the um, tempering curve. This chalk is so fun. So you have temperature on the y-axis, I remember, <laughs> time on the x-axis. That's right, right? X? Okay. So first you're melting your chocolate, heating it up to about 55 degrees Celsius. And in France, oh, I'll show you how we do it. We actually, the French pastry chefs use their underlip as their thermometer. So they use it right on the spatula, but because of COVID, we started not doing that. So do like this. And it should sting a little bit. Your body's about 37 degrees Celsius, so you can use that as a really good thermometer to tell where the chocolate is in its curve. So this is the slightly stinging your underlip point. And then you start cooling it down, taking off the heat. You can, um, you can stir it over like an ice bath if you want to, if you're really careful, but not so much that it sets up. You just have to like dip it in occasionally. Um, you could take it outside to a cooler room to stir it. I used to take it into the walk-in at Chez Panisse to stir it, which is a little risky because of the moisture, but I did it anyway. Um, or sometimes I take it outside, but you just have to be careful not to let anything drip in it from the elements. So this is your cooling down stage, and then you can add your seed here if you want to. If you add your seed, you just keep stirring until you get to about 31 degrees Celsius, and then you can use your chocolate. Um, but you want to keep it between like 33 and 30. If you go above 33, it gets streaky. Um, and then you have to start over the whole curve again. Poop. If you go below, it gets solidified and looks like poop, so you don't want to go below. And sometimes you have to start over too because it's too thick at that point. So you want it to be both thick and cool at the end. If you put this on your lip, it's going to feel like cold and refreshing. Um, and if it's nice and smooth, that's how you know you have tempered chocolate. Um, if you wanted to do it the old-fashioned way, the way that you would need to do if you were making chocolate from the bean and you didn't already have chocolate, I guess if you had your own chocolate, you could temper, you could seed with your former batch of chocolate. But if you have totally new chocolate, you want to make tempered chocolate, you would need to cool it down to like 28 or 29 degrees, and then you get some crystal formations, and then you melt it you go quickly heat it back up to like 31 and you're melting out the bad crystals and only the good crystals remain. And that's the, when you see people doing it on like a marble slab, that's what they're doing. They're taking like a third of the chocolate, putting it on the marble slab, crystallizing it and then melting it back into the slightly warmer chocolate. Does that make sense? 
We should, um, oh, do we have any of that paper? We could do some tests. Yes. Okay. So all my seed is melted, so I'll just keep adding some seed. It takes a lot of time to temper chocolate. You have to be very patient. Ooh, thank you. These are little test strips that we do. Um, dunking it in. If you do this at the very beginning, you'll notice that um, nothing happens for a really long time. It just like stays liquid. But as you get closer to being in temper, it sets up really quickly. So when you're in temper, it takes like three minutes to set up. When we're dipping a tray of chocolates, we do like three rows and then start looking back at the first one to make sure it's setting up and that there are no streaks. And then we know that we're safe. But if nothing happens, if you get through your whole tray and nothing is set up, you know you're not in temper and you've ruined your whole batch. So there's no way to really, you can turn it into hot chocolate or mousse or something, <laughs> but you wasted a lot of time. Any questions about tempering? Because the stirring just takes a while. Let me know if you have any questions. Are we going to look at tempered chocolate under the, th under the uh, maybe when it's done? I don't know if, if you want to. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Anybody have any questions? Can we see anything, Daniel? I'm not sure we can see this. Oh, oh, oh. Um, hi, I have a question. That's if the, we're uh, doing that now, never mind. Which one is this? The tempered? So you can start to see crystals here, right? Because that's what the tempering does. It creates some crystals. And you can start to see facets. We didn't see this before. And that's what she's trying to do, is trying to make them into crystals. Do we have any ideas Very cool. why it's darker when it's tempered? Does anyone like relating to the structure? I'm Anybody have any ideas? I don't know. <laughs> I think it's shinier because you have these flat surfaces, so they reflect better. Mm -hmm. And they're all crystalline. And they're all the same uniform crystals. And you can see the crystals here. You don't see that. You didn't see that when it wasn't tempered. And you can still see a little bit of water. There's still some emulsion of water. But now everything's becoming much more faceted. I'll bet that if we let it cool down, we'll see even more faceting. Uh -huh. This is really great, Alexander. We never actually watched either tempering or making ganache. We never watched it with the microscope as you did. Me neither. So it's terrific. <laughs> it's been fun. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's thank Alexandra. <laughs>